So let's talk a bit about the present value operator. So th this is something that you've all come across in introductory finance. The idea is that cash flows at different dates are actually different currency. And the way that I go about expressing this to my students is to ask them to think about the following. Suppose you happen to be coming back from a foreign trip and you happen to have in your wallet or, or pocketbook 150 yen and 300 pounds sterling. Well, when you add that together, you're going to get 450, right? No? 450 what? You're, you're probably having a hard time processing now because you're trained not to add 150 yen to 300 pounds sterling. It makes no sense. They're, they're two different things. How can you add them? That's the point. You can't add them because they're in different units. You actually have to convert either yen to pounds or pounds to yen, and then you can add them and make meaning. But you can't do it unless they are of the same units. Well, that's exactly the way you ought to be thinking about cash flows at different points in time. You need to have an allergic reaction when you see people adding $20 million today to $60 million next year to get $80 million. That $80 million should give you as much discomfort as the 450 that I just asked you to add. And if you remember that, if that does give you an allergic reaction, you will rarely make mistakes in trying to value all sorts of important assets. So the idea is to first identify what currency we're talking about for specific cash flows. And by currencies, I'm referring to specific values at various different dates. Each date has its own exchange rate with another date. Now, as a matter of convention, what we typically do is to focus on today as the present and the, the, the day that we want to use our various different exchange rate to convert currencies into. And so if today is the relevant benchmark, today is the numeraire, it's the reserve currency of all of our analyses, then all we need to do is to figure out what the exchange rate is between a dollar tomorrow versus a dollar today, a dollar next year versus a dollar today, a dollar three years from now versus a dollar today. We just need to have all of these various different exchange rates. And once we do that, we've got our present value operator. The present value operator, this black box that tries to figure out what a sequence of cash flows is worth, all it is is a foreign currency translator. It just takes all of the various different foreign currencies and puts them into one currency, your favorite currency, and then it allows you to analyze that on an equal footing. That's pretty much it. That's the lesson of time value relations and net present value. It's to use a common currency. And so once you've got the cash flows and once you've got these exchange rates, you can actually calculate what the value is of any sequence of cash flows. And here's the very deep financial advice that I'm going to give you that will serve you well for the rest of your careers. Negative cash flows, don't take them. <laughs> Positive cash flows, take them. That, that's it. And if it's really positive, take a, a lot of that. Once you denominate everything in the common currency, decisions become really simple. The hard part is actually figuring out those currency exchange rates. And that's where financial markets really come to their forefront. They really help you in figuring out what those exchange rates are. They're not always correct. And maybe sometimes you know better than the market. I hope that's the case. But that's really where you use financial analysis to be able to make better decisions. Okay? So written in this way, we've got an expression for the, the present value operator. It's a very simple linear function. It's a multiplication of all of your different cash flows by the appropriate exchange rates to bring everything to the common currency of dollars today. And once you do that, you add them all up. What you want is to look for projects that have positive net present value and get rid of or sell projects that have negative net present value. Okay? So here's a very simple example. I won't 
insult you by taking you through it. You could take a look at it for yourself. But given a couple of exchange rates, you can actually value this particular net present value of a project requiring investment of $10 million and getting cash flows of $5 million in year one and $7 million in year two. Once you put it in this framework, it's pretty clear. Yes, this will give you $100,000 of net present value, uh, and that's a good thing, so you should take it. All right? Now, when we look at what determines the value of a dollar today versus next year or today versus two years from now, we often use a very simple rule of thumb to make our calculations easier. We don't have to do this, and in general, in practice, we won't do this, but for purposes of exposition and intuition, we often assume that the exchange rate takes on a very, very simple form, namely a kind of an interest rate calculation. So we assume that a dollar next year is going to be discounted at a certain rate. And that rate, R, is called the interest rate. There are actually many different names for it. Cost of capital, opportunity cost of capital, discount rate. But in general, the idea is simply to convert currency from one date to another. So a dollar next year is going to be worth 1 over 1 plus R this year. You think of, think of R as the discount rate. It discounts the future to the past because 1 over 1 plus r is going to be lower than 1, assuming that r is greater than 0. In other words, we're assuming that interest rates are generally positive. That assumption is tantamount to saying that most people prefer more money now to later. Right? You would prefer a dollar today to a dollar next year. I think that's a pretty safe assumption, don't you? If anybody violates that assumption, Please see me after class. I'll be happy to help you out with your personal preferences and make you very much better off. So if that's the case, then R is non-negative. We have this relationship under the assumption that that discount rate doesn't change over time. So if I have a dollar two years from now and I bring it back to today, then I'm assuming it's 1 over 1 plus R squared, R cubed, R to the fourth, and so on and so forth. All right, that's an assumption, a simplification that'll make our calculations a lot easier. It's an approximation to a much, much more complicated reality. In general, these exchange rates can be anything. They're all over the place. But for simplicity, we're going to assume, for now, that if we allow this R to be constant, we're going to get some nice simplifications. And it works in the reverse. If we want to take a dollar and let it grow over time, a dollar today is going to be worth more than a dollar next year. Right? for the exact same reasons about time preferences. So under the assumption that this rate of time preference is constant, we actually get a very simple algebraic form for the exchange rate. It's 1 over 1 plus r to the t, where t is the number of time periods that we are trying to convert currencies between. And so this basically shows us the rate of decay that we experience with these kinds of uh, processes. Now, all of this, I think, makes a lot of sense to you because you've had introductory finance. You've seen this calculation. You've done these kinds of present value problems. I just want to point out one aspect of this that actually has some really serious scientific implications. We're not going to have time to talk about it here, but in some of your other classes, you may come about and deal with it. What this says is that a dollar in the very, very distant future is almost worthless today. Another way of saying that is that we, today, from a financial perspective, couldn't care less about what's going to happen in the distant future. And if you don't believe me, take a look at an Excel spreadsheet and calculate the value of a dollar 150 years from now. Calculate what it is today for whatever interest rate you think is realistic. And use a really low one because that'll maximize the value. If you use an interest rate of 10%, I can guarantee you that stuff that happens 30 years from now won't matter to you if you've got a discount rate of 10%. But a 1% discount rate will give you an opportunity to have that rate of decay be very, very slow, as you see here on the green curve versus the blue curve. The blue curve discounts the future much, much more quickly than the green curve. Can anybody think of a context where that might be at odds with our ethic about what should be going on in the far distant future? Yeah. 
exactly, the environment. If we ask the question, how much do we care about the environment 150 years from now, using a discount rate of 1%, 2%, whatever that number is, I can tell you from a financial perspective, we couldn't care less about that. It just doesn't matter. When I say it doesn't matter, I'm not telling you that that's the way it should be. I'm telling you that the way, that's the way it is if you use this framework. This framework will take a look at the cash flows that you get from beautiful streams that are unpolluted 150 years from now, or skies that are not covered with air pollution, and it will calculate the economic value of that quantity 150 years from now, and when you take the present value of it, it just doesn't matter. And that's part of the problem with all of these debates about climate change. It's that if you use this kind of a framework, it's going to give you an answer that seems to be at odds with what our, our ethic is about the sustainability of our current activities. So I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm simply telling you this is hap happens to be a real thing about this framework. And it means that if you care about the environment, if you're worried about sustainability, you need to address this issue. You need to think about how to deal with the fact that most individuals and decision makers will be using this framework to value these future commodities. And you'll have to have an answer for the analysis that they do, which says that it just doesn't matter from a financial perspective. And the answer, of course, is that finance is not the only thing that matters in the world, as difficult as it is for me to admit that as a financial economist. There are other considerations that you need to bring to bear, but you need to think about how to do that intelligently. It's a bit off topic, but we will talk a bit about that when we deal with things like vaccines, because that's an example where the numbers don't work if you just look at the, the present value of cash flows. You need to make other arguments that will ultimately end up swaying the decision makers. Questions or comments? No? Okay. So, we now have an explicit expression for the present value operator, assuming that these interest rates are constant over time. And the idea is to take positive NPV projects and not to take negative NPV projects. But in order to use this framework, we have to be assuming that markets are perfect. And so I'm going to ask you to keep that in the back of your mind. We're not going to question it right now, but in about three or four weeks, when we start applying this to various different biomedical contexts, markets will not be perfect. And so we're going to have to deal with these frictions in ways that are going to be useful. So I'll get to that.